uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak to everybody here. And it's an honor to be a speaker with such great uh, faculty and uh, physician scientists today. So today I want to talk about uh, DNA methylation and um, a little more focus on the practical aspect um, and how we use it uh, in updated classifications of CNS tumors. Um, so just a little bit of background about DNA methylation related to tumors in general, um, just so we have a, a starting foundation. Um, first of all, DNA methylation signatures across the genome reflect two important distinctive features of uh, cancer. One is the methylation pattern for the tissue of origin, such as brain, liver, kidney itself. And then as tumors go through oncogenic uh, progression, that they, re they acquire certain uh, patterns of methylation. And for most tumor types, this uh, leads to a unique signature, uh, genome-wide methylation signature that can be uh, um, leveraged in diagnostic uh, terms. And there tends to be uh, spatial and temporal consistency, both um, across recurrences of tumors and uh, within tumors. There is some heterogeneity uh, within them, and we can see some switching. But overall, the epigenetics of these tumors tend to be stable, uh, which really uh, helps with our um, classification of these. So uh, DNA methylation-based classification of CNS tumors first came about in 2018, which was uh, pioneered by David Kapper and the Heidelberg Group uh, through DKFC, where they took uh, a large reference cohort did machine learning, um, forest plot, um, <clears throat> machine learning, and were able to resolve different tumor types. And we can see in this dimensionality reduction uh, plot here, this Tisney plot, where different tumor types really resolve into uh, a unique spaces within these maps, which is reflective of the um, the classifiers that, that we use. And then this can be used to generate um, uh, classification, pathology reports, and things now that many people or many centers have begun to either include in their diagnostic practices or have been sending them to um, consult practices such as ours. And this has really improved the diagnostic accuracy uh, when we think about CNS tumor classification. So what I'm showing here is the evolution of the WHO classification the CNS tumors really in the late 70s, well, I mean, earlier than that, before the WHO, where everything was histomorphology based. And then uh, in the 90s, we came up with things that were showing cell of origin or differentiation markers using immunohistochemistry. In 2016, genetic signatures were incorporated in the classification of tumors. And in 2021, genetics were also incorporated into grading um, schemes. And then with the evolution of DNA methylation and epigenetic signatures, we can also uh, use epigenetic signatures of these DNA methylation profiles to make diagnostic um, classifications uh, in the clinical space. And this is uh, really kind of reflective. I know that there's not a lot of time to go into this, but with the new uh, fifth edition of the 2021 WHO, there's been 22 new tumor types that have been added. I'm not gonna go all over all of them. I just wanted to show that uh, most of them all still resolve within their own DNA methylation profiles as well. So just, just this is a really uh, emerging diagnostic tool that is help, helping us um, really provide accurate diagnoses. And just a, a little bit about, um, before we go into the clinical utility of DNA methylation, uh, these whole methylation signatures can be used to do uh, a couple of different things as far as uh, discovery. First, the discovery of new CNS tumor types where you do machine learning or uh, multi or dimensional reduction analysis. And you can really see clusters of, uh, of groups of tumors that have not been previously characterized or they don't fall nicely into these methylation classifications. And just one of these that is um, was recently published by one of my colleagues here, Drew Pratt, was uh, uh, something that he identified as high-grade glioma with pleomorphic and pseudopapillary features, which is a proposed circumscribed glioma. And in this, when you go back and look at the, the types, um, it really has kind of distinctive histology. It has uh, 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 
outcome that's better than glioblastoma, even though a lot of these can look like glioblastoma. And it has its own genetic signature, including uh, TP53 mutations, RB mutations. And uh, what tends to be the most recurrent genomic alteration is uh, monosomy chromosome 13. So uh, this is just one example, but as we've been leading up, methylation has been a really nice discovery tool for new CNS tumor types. And then within CNS tumor types, um, methylation is not great at providing grade, but what we can do is we're starting to come up with um, prognostically, prognostically relevant uh, clinical subtypes within um, um, tumor types. And this is just one example that uh, we published last year of uh, looking at one of the newer entities that was added to the WHO called high-grade astrocytoma with pyloid features, so-called HGAP, where we did identify three subtypes. And within them, it looks like there's a, a, a small subset that are associated with NF1 syndrome, looks to be localized entirely to the posterior fossa region, and has a worse uh, clinical outcome compared to the other types. So really discovery of uh, the subtypes within the types has been um, one of the driving forces for uh, classification as we go forward with the next iterations of the WHO. Okay, with that background, I want to talk a little bit about the, the clinical utility of whole genome DNA methylation profiling for CNS tumors. And this is going to come from our experience here. And uh, I just want to acknowledge Ken Aldapi, who had, he's the head of uh, the methylation service. And this is really his, his work, and he's been pioneering this. And he and Martha Cazado uh, are the two neuropathologists who do most of the clinical um, workhorse, workhorse share of the uh, load. And then uh, Drew Pratt and myself, we're more on the physician scientist but we track, but we do do some of the clinical methylation. But um, just kind of our experience, I just wanted to show we get cases, uh, referral cases, consult cases, mostly from other pathologists throughout North America and uh, a lot from Brazil. And we're starting to expand into other regions. We profiled approximately 3,000 cases last year, which is uh, probably the largest uh, referral consult for uh, methylation in the country. And we do about 60 cases per week. So we're getting uh, pretty good at uh, doing this analysis. One of the benefits from this is also that uh, we can use a single platform of methylation to get multi-alteration determinations just beyond methylation class. So here I'm showing a copy number alteration plot so we can see things aneuploidy. We can see gene amplifications like EGFR, MDM2, CDK4, things like that. We can see uh, polysomy and monosomy uh, as well, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, as well. We can also go on to a gene level where we can see smaller segmentations of genes and see inferred breakpoints. Something like maybe a rel -A fusion ependymoma, where if something matches to that class, we can go and zoom in on those genes and we can see where there's a breakpoint. Subsequently, go on to RNA seq and confirm the, um, the gene fusion. With this, we also get 1p19q codeletion, which goes along with copy number alterations and uh, MGMT methylation as part of our standard workup. So one of the, the um, most questions that we get asked by the outside um, pathologists are cases that are don't quite fit into a WHO classification, and you kind of see them as a descriptive diagnosis, like high-grade glioma with whatever alterations or low-grade glioneuronal tumor, but you know we really want to be more accurate so we can help the, the clinical team manage these patients. And uh, for uh, the early class classes that we, or the early cases that we did, almost 300 of these, about half of them we were able to resolve with uh, methylation testing and give a definitive diagnosis for the patient and uh, the clinical team. And just wanted to show you uh, one example of that. So uh, we had a 47 year old man, uh, and we published this. Um, and this is available in the literature. A 47-year-old man presented with co declining cognition, gait instability, speech difficulty. He had this uh, extensive bifrontal non-enhancing mass. And on histology, it was a mitotically active diffuse glioma that looked astrocytic. So historically, it would have been called an anaplastic astrocytoma. It had some OLEG2 positivity. And on immunohistochemistry, it had ATRX loss. 
Okay, so the differential diagnosis for this is actually quite big when you think about a, a astrocytic tumor with ATRX loss. Anything from IDH mutant astrocytoma, glioblastoma, pediatric type high grade glioma, H gap, uh, the diffuse hemispheric glioma, H3. G34 altered, and it can range from grade twos to grade four. So we really want to come up with a more accurate classification. When they did this on the outside, they sent the next generation sequencing panel to Mayo, and they found, they confirmed the uh, mutation for ATRX and P53, but IDH1, IDH2, and H33A genes were um, all wild type. So it didn't appear to be uh, IDH mutant astrocytoma or a um, diffuse hemispheric glioma. So they sent it to the um, NIH for methylation profiling. And when we got it, it was a, all, we used three classifiers and dimensionality reduction. And all classifiers matched to the diffuse hemisphere glioma G34 altered, which was unusual because on the outside, they did the H33A um, sequencing and it didn't show up. But when we did an expanded NGS panel here at the NIH, we saw that there was a, a G34 mutation, H33B, so a non-canonical histone gene having this. So then it all kind of fit the histology, the, the clinical imaging, the sequencing, and the, um, and the methylation. So methylation in this case helped solve the, uh, the diagnosis. Uh, another thing that I've become to appreciate is that uh, we get cases here um, a lot of times where the leading diagnosis is glioblastoma. It's got the histological features that we've known for years to be uh, glioblastoma, but about 10% of these resolve into tumors that have better clinical outcome, including low-grade gliomas and like something like a high-grade astrocytoma with pyloid features or IDH mutant gliomas that had non-canonical uh, mutations. So we're able to come up with things that used to be glioblastoma, but are better for patients. We also use uh, DNA methylation to do medulloblastoma subtyping, which is pretty common. Um, and then risk stratification for meningiomas, right? As a uh, pathologist, I'm, I'm the first one to say we have a suboptimal um, prediction of who does well or who does bad uh, based on our grading alone. Um, and there's four inner observer uh, concordance along with these, but there's been um, uh, a, a push to do methylation classes of these meningiomas where you can get restratification of these either benign, intermediate, or malignant tumors. And uh, recently there was this JCO paper that uh, had come up with a risk stratification meningio uh, for meningiomas, which incorporates methylation families, either the benign, intermediate, or malignant grades. And we've been uh, incorporating all these into a model score at the NIH for all our meningiomas. And there's a, a, a pretty strong uh, outcome associated with these, which seems to be more reproducible and better than histology alone. Okay, and so I'll just try and get up as uh, quick as I can with the last few minutes. Um, so while DNA methylation profiling does a lot of great things, there are limitations and potential pitfalls in methylation profiling for CNS tumors. First of all, it's not a plug and play system. You can't just do uh, perform methylation profiling and expect it to be the answer. The same way as genetics didn't provide an answer for all tumors. Immunohistochemistry didn't really. You have to incorporate clinical radiographic and all the pathology features to come up with an integrated diagnosis. And methylation profiling should be interpreted interpreted by a neuropathologist or clinical team that's uh, adept at understanding the um, nuances of the this platform. Um, another um, limitation is that high confidence matches can be misleading within profiles. For example, we had this 39-year-old man who had a frontal mass, it looked like a diffuse astrocytic glioma. On the classifiers, they all pointed with um, strong uh, indications that this was an astrocytoma IDH mutant. We do the NGS, there's no mutations in IDH1, IDH2, P53, or ATRX. So this is not a IDH mutant astrocytoma. This is not an IDH mutant glioma at all. So then we have to come up with something more descriptive where there's discrepancies between the epigenetic profiling and the other features of these tumors. 
not all methylation classes equal a CNS tumor type. I'm just going to talk a little bit about these like things like oligosarcoma that are IDH mutant. They seem to behave worse, almost like a grade four, but we can't call an oligodendroglioma a grade four. There's also these fusion tumors that are coming up, um, like this uh, neuropathial tumor with PAT-Z1 fusion, and there's a whole list of these. And these adult type diffuse high-grade gliomas that are these subtypes with different letters that look historically like glioblastoma, but they have a better uh, clinical outcome in general. And approximately a third of our cases are without a high confidence match. And we publish on this and other groups have published on this as well. So uh, we don't get an answer in all cases, but we do get, get enough to where we're learning more. And the contributing factors to either low or no methylation matches, including um, maybe rare tumor types that are not presented in the training set. And as we gather more cases of these types, we're able to improve our um, diagnostic algorithms for uh, classification and include those, like with the HPAP that I was talking about. Uh, there's limited bioinformatic pipelines. A lot of these are relying on a single reference data set, which makes it uh, difficult. And there's technical reasons, either low DNA input for small biopsies, low tumor content or purity, the failed DNA bisulfite conversion when you get the DNA process, or poor quality DNA. So old tissue blocks like 10 years older or older uh, will not give you a um, classification. So in summary, the uh, whole G genome DNA methylation profiling is useful for tumor type discovery and precision diagnostics. It adds value to routine clinical surgical neuropathology. Methylation profiling does not solve all cases, but we are improving with experience. And uh, with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, PJ. That was a fantastic talk uh, and very helpful. I found uh, in, in my practice, methylation profiling has made a, a really big difference in a couple of cases and has completely changed the course of clinical care. And um, I think when I think about it, the big question in my mind is how scalable is it? And I wonder if you could briefly comment on that. Um, scalability, uh, it, it depends on, well, at the NIH, we do a lot, but we're, we're limited by intramural funding, right? We can only do so many of these because we can't charge patients for testing or anything. So we're really limited by that. So we can only do about 60 cases a week. Now we've been talking to other outside people who might be able to scale up and do that. So you could have like a fee for service type thing where we'd also be involved in integrating and helping with the, um, the interpretation and, and all that, but it's really limited by how right now billing insurance reimbursement and, and things like that. Well, thank you again. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Cobbs, who's going to introduce our next speaker.